So I would like to start welcoming you all to the 12th webinar of the graduate program in physics of the Federal University of Pará in Amazonia, Brazil. I ask everyone to kindly leave the audio and video streams turned off, except for the moment you're going to speak. Questions will be allowed after the webinar, unless otherwise requested by the speaker. The questions can be made using the chat, and I ask the secretariat to kindly help uh, in registering the order of the questions. Today, we will have the honor to listen to Professor Robert Manuel Wald, who is a fellow of the American Physical Society and of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and is a member of the National Academy of Sciences in the US. Among the distinctions awarded to Professor Wald, I can mention the Einstein Prize given every second year since 2003 by the American Physical Society, which he received in 2017. Fortunately for us, Professor Wald has visited and given excellent seminars in our graduate program in Amazonia in three occasions, in 2014, 17, and last year. Professor Wald received his PhD from Princeton University under the direction of John Archibald Wheeler. Professor Wald has been working on classical general relativity, cosmology, and quantum phenomena related to gravity with special emphasis to black hole physics, which will be the subject of his talk today. At present, Professor Wald is the Charles Swift Distinguished Service Professor at the Department of Physics, the Enrico Fermi Institute, and the College of the University of Chicago in the United States. Professor Robert Wald is well known worldwide for his relevant scientific contributions to gravitation and also for his excellent textbook, General Relativity, published by Chicago University Press, from which essentially all last generation's graduate students in the field, including me, have learned from. He has also written the more advanced book, Quantum Field Theory in Curved Spacetime and Black Hole Thermodynamics, putting the formulation of the subjects on a rigorous mathematical footing, as well as the popular science book titled Space, Time and Gravity, The Theory of the Big Bang and Black Holes, which is certainly a stimulating reading for all those interested in the field. Well, the temptation to make an extended introduction to Professor Bob Wald is strong, but I need to control myself and give the voice to our honored speaker, thanking him once more for having accepted our invitation. Professor Bob Wall, the audience is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So I assume my audio is working and my slides are showing. Luis will inform me otherwise if anything goes wrong uh, at any point. And uh, yeah, I'd like to hear what the extended introduction would be. That was uh, uh, you know, I thought quite extended on its own and, and very nice. Uh, thank you very much for that, that introduction. So uh, what I wanted to tell you about is, uh, well, there have been really remarkable developments over the last 50 years in the theory of black holes, their relationship to thermodynamics and information loss uh, uh, issues that have, you know, thereby arisen and this is there is still a lot of active research ongoing and i think further discoveries yet to come so i i thought i would uh tell you a little bit about this uh in this uh in this seminar so let me begin with what a black hole is and in very simple terms a black hole is just a region of space time where gravity is so strong that nothing that, that enters the region can escape from it, and that nothing includes light. So black holes will indeed look black uh, if you're looking at them because no light is escaping from them. So, I mean, black holes are usually talked about as very exotic objects uh, in the theory of general relativity, but some, uh, as I'll emphasize, not all, but some of the basic idea of a black hole goes back 
well over two centuries to work of Mitchell and independently of Laplace, uh, what these authors did in essence was calculate the escape velocity of a body, uh, you know, a test body of, uh, from the uh, surface of a planet or a star. Uh, and I actually, does my cursor work? I guess I can't, in the full screen mode, I can't point. Uh, that was something perhaps I should have tested, but uh, um, in any case, I'll, I'll see how it goes without it. Otherwise, I can get out of the full screen mode and, and uh, uh, work with it otherwise. Anyway, I have a formula up here for the escape velocity. Uh, and what Mitchell and Laplace noted is if the escape velocity is will be larger than the speed of light if the body's radius is less than what we now refer to as the Schwarzschild radius of the body, uh, for which I've given the formula. And what they predicted is that stars with radius less than the Schwarzschild radius uh, would appear black because any light that tried to escape from the surface of the body would fall back, eventually fall back on the body. Well, the basic difference uh, in the picture of a black hole in general relativity from the picture in Newtonian gravity that uh, Mitchell and Laplace had can really be understood by the, from the fact that in special and general relativity, nothing can travel faster than light. So if the light is pulled back in, everything else is going to be pulled back in. The everything else includes the surface of the body itself or the whole body itself. And the corresponding result in general relativity is that a body whose radi who's been, which has been compacted down to such an extent that it's smaller than its Schwarzschild radius, so that would be for a solar mass sized object, for a solar mass object, we're talking about compacted to less than about three kilometers in radius. Uh, and this goes in proportion to mass. For very massive black holes, you can get down to this radius at very low density. So this is not necessarily totally exotic conditions, but such a body just can't exist in equilibrium it'll have to undergo complete gravitational collapse to a singularity. One can prove in the context of general relativity, in fact, that you quite generally that you have to have uh, a singularity when you get conditions like corresponding to when the body, a body is within its Schwarzschild radius. There's a lot of evidence, although it's rather indirect of you assume that it's false uh, and get a contradiction as opposed to you prove that it's true. Uh, but there, there's considerable evidence in favor of what's called the cosmic sensor conjecture, which states that the end product always of gravitational collapse to a singularity will always have to be a black hole uh, with the singularity hidden within the black hole. In other words, the singularity will always be surrounded by a region of no escape. Uh, that's probably if true, as we believe, would be a good thing because it protects us from, from these singularities unless we ourselves choose to go into the black hole uh, and fall into the singularity. So I'll give you a, a much clearer picture of what a black hole is uh, and its properties uh, in, an, in a few minutes. But I thought I would spend a few minutes, uh, although this, is, this talk is focused on the theory of black holes and their theoretical properties and connections to thermodynamics and information loss. Uh, I thought I'd say a few words about black holes in the real universe, because there's very good reason to believe that black holes do exist, both the very good, both theoretical and observational reasons 
to believe that black holes really do exist in our universe. They're not just theorist uh, playthings and possibilities. And there are three basic processes by which black holes may have formed in our universe. Um, one is the collapse of stars that have exhausted their therm thermonuclear fuel. If the, if the star at the end of its thermonuclear evolution, or I mean, that can be early if it's a low mass star, uh, it has mass less than 1.4 solar masses, uh, then electron degeneracy pressure will be sufficient to hold the star up and keep it in equilibrium forever. Uh, uh, those stars are known as white dwarfs. They're commonly seen, and those stars will just, they've stopped burning therm thermonuclear fuel. They'll just cool down forever uh, and be much like planets or whatever. I mean, uh, fairly inert objects that stay around. But if the mass is larger than 1.4 solar masses, then they cannot be held up by by electron degeneracy pressure. That's what Chandrasekhar showed in the early 1930s. Uh, and such stars will have to collapse further. Now, if their mass is less than about two solar masses, I think with Further observations from LIGO and elsewhere will we'll probably have a, a more precise upper limit on the possible mass of neutron stars. It's somewhat above two solar masses, but clearly not well above two solar masses. I mean, a little bit above two solar masses. Then neutron degeneracy pressure and nuclear forces can hold such stars up. But if the stars are more massive than that, you know, at the end of their thermonuclear evolution, I mean, of course, there, there could be a supernova explosion where they blow a lot of mass off. So it's their final mass uh, that we're worried about. But if that's bigger than two solar masses, uh, then complete gravitational collapse to a black hole will have to occur. Now, there's a rather narrow mass range that one would expect to get black holes produced in this manner. Uh, you can't get black holes less than about two solar masses this way. But stars with mass, well, stars in the present universe with mass greater than about 100 solar masses uh, don't exist because of pulsational instabilities. So that limits the mass range. Now, the first generation of stars may have been more massive. So one may have gotten black holes of several hundred solar masses uh, in that way. Uh, but that's still a limited, uh, quite a limited range. A second process by which black holes could form is the collapse of a central region of a galaxy or a dense star cluster. Uh, exactly how this works is still not, you know, there are a lot of mechanisms that would potentially work. There's no, you know, where the stars disrupt each other and form a supermassive object that collapses. And, uh, or maybe you have a, a bunch of several hundred solar mass black holes that coalesce and accrete a lot more or whatever. Uh, but the fact is that almost all nearby galaxies, and that includes our own galaxies, galaxy uh, show clear evidence of having a massive uh, uh, black hole at their center. And we're learning in recent years that these, black, I mean, we're finding quasars at higher and higher redshift. So the central engine of quasars is believed to be a massive black hole. Uh, so the presence of quasars shows the presence or indicates the presence of a black hole. Uh, and these happen quite early. I mean, I think that's an interesting question as to how they form uh, quite early. I should say we have a lot of observational evidence well, for the presence of black holes 
massive black holes at the center of galaxies. And also we have a lot of, I mean, a couple of dozen X-ray binary systems that show with regard to the first mechanism, uh, objects, you know, compact objects of mass significantly greater than two solar masses uh, in X-ray binaries that are also presumably must be black holes. Finally, it's worth mentioning that we could have gotten black holes formed by a completely different process. We could have had black holes forming in the very early universe by the collapse of overdense regions. Uh, it's very hard to make an Earth-sized uh, black hole in the present universe because you'd have to collapse the Earth down to roughly the size of a ping pong ball by other means, and then gravity would take over and, and uh, collapse it the rest of the way. Um, but that's awfully hard to imagine doing in the present universe. But in the early universe, you had average density of the universe early enough, the density of the Earth in a ping pong ball, in the size of a ping pong ball. I mean, that go back earlier, it's even more dense. And if you had over, sufficiently over-dense regions in the early universe, uh, you could have collapsed to black holes uh, then and there. What's interesting about this process is it could produce black holes of any mass range. Well, I've indicated some observational evidence for black holes in terms of X-ray binaries and quasars and other evidence for massive black holes at the center of galaxies. But there's recently been, I mean, in the last five years for LIGO, uh, been, you know, very new observational evidence for the presence of black holes. In fact, black holes of, you know, tens of solar masses, 30, 40 solar masses, and even higher in, in a very recently announced observation uh, that have been detected by LIGO. So LIGO, just to say a few words about that, because this is certainly one of the major developments of the last five years, uh, LIGO is a huge interferometer. Uh, this is what the one at Hanford looks like, where you see the two arms of the interferometer uh, extending kilometers out in size. Uh, four kilometers, um, and this is uh, a simple, very simplified diagram of the inner workings of uh, LIGO. It is just a Michelson interferometer. Uh, the point is that if a gravitational wave is incident, let's say normally, uh, on this interferometer, well, and if it has the right polarization, it will simultaneously shrink one arm and expand the other arm in an oscillatory fashion. That's what uh, the gravitational wave does. Uh, um, and so if you can detect these incredibly tiny displacements caused by the gravitational wave, you can detect the gravitational wave in this manner. Now, what is interesting uh, and why this, it's relevant for this talk is if you have coalescing black holes, so you have two black holes that are in a binary orbit and they in spiral as indicated in this diagram, they will in spiral because they're losing energy by gravitational radiation. So they're becoming more tightly bound and eventually they will merge and presumably will form one bigger black hole. Then, as illustrated in the sine wave of higher and higher frequency, like waveform that is illustrated uh, uh, in the next uh, row of this diagram, you'll, uh, you'll get a characteristic gravitational wave signal. Um, so this is the kind of waveform that you'd 
theoretically predict from coalescing black holes. And this is what the Hanford and Livingston detectors saw, uh, well, five years ago, almost exactly to the day uh, uh, in their detectors. It corresponds exactly to this kind of gravitational waveform. And of course, there have been many other events that have been observed since then. This remains one of the very best ones uh, that, uh, in fact, LIGO has seen over the last five years. They'll be releasing their catalog of their third observing run. So they'll, there were already about 10 such events in their first two runs. There'll be many more in the third observing run. Um, another very dramatic uh, observational evidence of a black hole uh, was announced a bit, uh, well, a year and a half ago uh, by the Event Horizon Telescope. And this is literally a picture of the center of the galaxy M87, which already was known on other grounds. It's an active galactic nucleus to contain or that it should contain a massive black hole of about a billion solar masses. And this is indeed what was seen by the Event Horizon Telescope. And that dark area in the middle is the black hole uh, at the center of the galaxy M87. Now, what you're seeing in this picture, of course, is the radiation from matter surrounding the black hole that is emitting uh, radiation to us that we can see. If you want to know what a pure black hole looks like, I have a slide of that. Uh, that is exactly what a pure black hole would look like. If I had the pointer, I could uh, you know, point with the uh, some, you, but you can pick out on your own any circular disk you want in there in the middle of the screen to represent the black hole and the rest is the dark surrounding. So you're not going to learn a lot about black holes by looking at them because they're black. Uh, but what you are going to, uh, I think, get a much clearer picture than I've given you so far of what a black hole is like uh, would be if I drew a space-time diagram uh, of a black hole. So uh, let me actually ask Luis's opinion on whether I should, uh, since he knows what the non-full screen looks like, uh, whether it would be worth it to go out of that where I think I can use my pointer uh, it's completely up to you, Professor. I think uh, the audience is enjoying a lot your talk without the pointer, but it's completely up to you. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll stick with this, but if you change your, I mean, so uh, what I've, I think I can tell people in words what, where to look on this diagram for the things that I'm talking about. So we'll see if if you want, you can uh, come out from the full screen, uh, use your mouse pointer, and then get back to the full screen. It's up to you, Professor. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, let me uh, le let me try. And if I if if I find it difficult to explain what what to look at, or if you find it difficult, uh, you, Luis, find it difficult to follow where I'm talking about, let me know, and I'll and I'll. Uh, go to the pointer. I'll, I'll stick with this for now. So what I've drawn here is a space-time diagram of gravitational collapse to a black hole. So in some rough sense, the uh, time going forward in time corresponds to upward in the diagram, and spatial directions are shown horizontally. Now, using perspective, even though this is a space-time diagram, I can show as many as two spatial dimensions. I can't show three. So one spatial, at least one spatial dimension is always suppressed in a space-time diagram. And this one, I've, I've only suppressed one. 
So if you want to follow the, the history of what's going on, you need to start at the bottom of the page, which shows what's going on at early times. And there's what kind of looks like a semicircle at the very bottom of this diagram. That's really a two sphere, and that represents the surface of some star that's starting to undergo collapse. And if you follow the black, what I've drawn in black up forward in time, well, you can see that the outer surface of the star is getting to smaller and smaller radius. And eventually it collapses, it reaches zero radius, reaches that in finite time, uh, and creates a singularity that I've drawn in purple-ish color with a jagged line, you know, labeled singularity. So all of the matter of this star that collapsed uh, falls into this singularity. And that's what happens in the gravitational collapse. You collapse a star, it collapses to a singularity that persists. So you might now wonder where is the black hole? And I can show you that only by drawing in light cones. Um, so if you look at the blue cone that's leftmost in the diagram, that is showing a light cone of an event that's fairly far from the black hole. So the light cone is just what is traced out in a space-time diagram from light emitted from an event, which propagates out in a spherical manner, but of course goes forward in time as well. So it traces out what looks like a cone in a space-time diagram. And, you know, you've most of you have surely seen light cones drawn in special relativity, you know, usually with 45 degree angles. Uh, and that's what I, what the light cone looks like far from the black hole. But near the singularity, uh, if you look at the cone closest to the singularity, it's all tipped over close to the singularity. I mean, pointing toward the singularity. And in fact, all of the light emitted from that event that I've shown with the cone will fall into the singularity. And any observer has to move within the light cone and any observer will fall into the singularity. So that event with that very tipped over light cone is in a region of no escape there is a boundary to that region, which is what I've illustrated with that red dotted cylinder, which is known, that boundary is known as the event horizon of the black hole. It is at radius given by the same formula as Mitchell and Laplace derived. Uh, and at that radius, the light cone is tipped over so all of the light rays will go into the singularity except one that is tangent to the horizon, which will run along the horizon. Uh, so once you're outside the event horizon, you are outside the black hole and with a powerful enough rocket ship, you can escape or some light rays that are sent nearly radially outward will escape everything else will fall into the black hole and fall into the singularity. So that is what a black hole is like. It's a region of empty space time. There's no matter, but it's a region of no escape in this sense. Now, that picture that I drew, I mean, has, I'm, I'm not only drawing four dimensions on two, which is a bit problematic, but I'm drawing four curved dimensions on two flat dimensions. So there are distortions uh, in that picture. And there is an alternate way of drawing the, that space-time diagram, which gives you a little less of a feeling of the collapse down to zero radius and so on, but gives you a better picture of what the light cones are doing and what uh, uh, 
you know, and, and most importantly, the nature of the singularity. So this is important to understand. So I've drawn, now I've suppressed the angular direction. So this is purely a radial and time direction. On, on the left of this figure, we have an origin of coordinates line. So that's not a singularity or anything. That's just r equals zero in spherical coordinates. And I've shown the same collapsing star, but in the, you can see in this diagram that it collapses down to a singularity that's really a space-like line. Yeah, I should say the light cone, uh, this diagram has been drawn so the light cones are at 45 degrees. So I've straightened out the light cones, but then everything else in the picture is correspondingly changed. And here you can see that the singularity created by the gravitational collapse is space-like in character. So it really corresponds to an end of time, not a point of space existing for all time. That singularity is also at zero radius. Spheres have zero size as you approach that space-like singularity in this curved space-time. Um, in this picture, though, the, uh, uh, you can see, as I've already indicated, the singularity is of an end-of-time character. Now, of course, classical general relativity is undoubtedly going to break down near the singularity. And when you get to Planckian scales, uh, close in space or time from the singularity, uh, you would no longer, I, I mean, one would no longer believe classical general relativity. But I've shown greatly exaggerated in distance from the singularity in this, uh, you know, it's much, much closer to the singularity than I've indicated, but in that sort of orange-brown color, I've indicated where Planckian curvatures are attained. So beyond that line, there is no reason to, you know, one shouldn't particularly believe this picture. But, uh, you know, that is very late in the game. And if you're going to modify that picture, the picture there, you're not going to change anything outside the black hole or anything for that matter inside the black hole until you get very near in time to the singularity. So the other thing this diagram shows more clearly is that the event horizon is a null surface. It is, well, you already saw it was tangent to the light cones, but crossing the event horizon, you know, trying to cross back out of the event horizon after you've crossed into it is equivalent in difficulty to going backward in time. And similarly, avoiding the singularity once you've gone into the black hole is of equivalent difficulty to going backward in time uh, in you know, ordinary special relativity. So if you know how to go backward in time, then you might well be able to get out of a black hole, but otherwise, uh, once you go into a black hole, you won't be able to get out. Okay, so now let me turn to the subject of black holes and thermodynamics, because this is, I think, without question, one of the most amazing developments in theoretical physics of the last half century. Uh, so I'm going to describe an analogy between laws of black hole physics and laws of thermodynamics that will, well, likely start out sounding like uh, a very forced artificial or superficial, maybe is better, uh, analogy. Um, but as you'll see, it uh, really keeps going and becomes clearly not just an analogy, but, a, but uh, uh, a statement that the physics is really the same. You'll see what I mean. But let me just start out with this analogy. So 
you can think of a stationary black hole. I mean, if a black hole is formed by gravitational collapse, it should settle down to a stationary final state, in fact, very quickly. You can kind of think of that as analogous to a body in thermal equilibrium. So indeed, you might imagine filling a box with gas. Uh, and if you fill a box with gas, the state of the gas will depend on the details of how you filled it, and it'll be a very complicated state. But if you wait, long enough, then it'll settle down to a state of thermal equilibrium where it's characterized by some very small number of state parameters, the total energy of the gas, the, the volume of the box, and the total number of particles uh, is really all you need to describe the thermal equilibrium state of the gas. Well, in a very similar manner, if you form a black hole by gravitational collapse, well, the state of the black hole as you're forming it and very soon after you formed it is going to depend on the, a lot of details of what you did. But again, you know, radiation will, that will depend on the details will go off to infinity or go into the black hole. And the black hole should very quickly station, uh, settle down to a stationary final state. And now a major achievement in general relativity in the late 60s and through the mid 70s was a proof uh, that, in fact, a stationary black hole is uniquely characterized by just its total mass and angular momentum. And if you allow electromagnetic fields and electric charges, then its electric charge uh, will also affect the final state, but that's it, independent of, there's just this, the, this small number of state parameters that characterizes the final stationary state of a black hole. Okay, well, that isn't, all that impressive, uh, but uh, as in terms of building up an analogy, uh, but things go a bit further with, if you look at the zeroth law of thermodynamics that says when you have a body in local thermal equilibrium, it, uh, you can assign a temperature locally to it, but if the body is in true thermal equilibrium, then the temperature has to be uniform. Uh, in a rather analogous uh, way, if you have a stationary black hole, you can define the notion of its surface gravity. Now, the word surface gravity is used in elementary physics to denote the acceleration of a body, you know, dropped at the surface of a planet. Well, in, in general relativity, if you drop a body, uh, it's not accelerating, but you can define it to be the acceleration that you have to give to a body in order to keep it stationary. Uh, if you define the surface gravity of a black hole that way, it would be infinite. You'd have to give it infinite acceleration to keep it stationary just outside the horizon. But if you multiply that by the redshift factor, then you uh, get something that does have a finite limit, finite and in general non-zero limit to the horizon. That's what's meant by the surface gravity of a black hole. And there's a non-trivial theorem in general relativity that the surface gravity uh, of a stationary horizon, uh, uh, the horizon of a stationary black hole, uh, has to be uniform over the horizon. It can't vary from point to point. So that's an analogy. Well, things get more interesting in terms of a non-trivial analogy if we look at the first law of thermodynamics, uh, which says that uh, if you have two thermal equilibrium states that are only a little bit different from each other, 
the change in the energy and the state parameters, I've only written in volume, but I could have written in number of particles or whatever other state parameters we have, are related to each other uh, by, well, there's a new quantity now that is being introduced, the entropy of the body. And the change in entropy is related to the change in the other in the energy and the other state parameters by the first law formula that I have written at the top of this slide. Well, it was proven uh, uh, in the early 70s or mid, early to mid 70s uh, that a mathematically analogous law holds for black holes. If you, the, state parameters of the black hole are its mass, angular momentum, and charge, and they are related to each other and the change in the area, the surface area of the event horizon of the black hole by the formula I've written down in the second equation. Uh, and this is a very uh, analogous uh, equation. Indeed, it would look more analogous if in thermodynamics we considered rotating or charged bodies where we would have exactly analogous terms to what is present uh, in the law I've written down for black holes. But what's by far more, even more remarkable uh, in terms of analogy is the analogy between the second law of thermodynamics and a theorem proven in general relativity known as the area theorem, proven by Hawking, in fact, that the event the area, the surface area of a, the event horizon of a black hole never decreases with time. So the area theorem says, uh, uh, proves that if the matter falling into a black hole has locally positive energy, then the area must be increasing with time. That's you know, a theorem. Well, it, it assumes cosmic censorship, but that is a general theorem. Uh, the second law is, you're all familiar with for sure, but that is really, you know, something that one would expect to hold with, just with overwhelmingly high probability as opposed to a theorem. But uh, nevertheless, I mean, it, holds it's not been you know violations have not been observed and there aren't that many laws of physics that talk about quantities being you know that can change with time but can only change in one direction so this is a rather striking analogy if we look at the analogous quantities uh appearing here well the mass and energy You'll have to look at the first two equations uh, since I can't point, but they appear just in the first law, but they appear in completely analogous positions. Uh, and it's not merely the, the way I chose to write the equations. I mean, it, it, uh, uh, but that gives a strong hint that this might be more than an analogy because in general relativity, mass and energy really are the same thing. Uh, the other quantities that play an analogous role are temperature and surface gravity, both in the zeroth law and in their position in the first law. Uh, but you know, I've chosen a particular numerical factor in front of the surface gravity and so on here you'll see why in a second but there the analogy would seem to end because a black hole it's complete is completely black and in a thermodynamic sense a black hole in classical general relativity has absolute zero temperature uh not you know some temperature that would be needed to make this analogy go. So that's where, you know, the most amazing result in the subject uh, came along uh, because although it's true that in classical general relativity, black holes are completely black, 
they, uh, uh, well, and, and it's, I mean, quantum field theory in curved space time is just as causal and so on as classical general relativity. So nothing's going to come out of a black hole. But what Hawking showed is that you get particle creation, which is occurring outside, very near, but outside of the black hole. And as a result of this particle creation, you'll get an exactly thermal flux of particles uh, uh, appearing to come from the black hole. Nothing is really coming from the black hole, but it will look to the observer like you're getting radiation from a black hole at this Hawking temperature of surface gravity over 2 pi. Now, this is a really small effect uh, for macroscopic black holes of a solar mass. A, a solar mass black hole would just have a temperature of 10 to the minus 7 degrees Kelvin. But in principle, this is a uh, major effect that I'll be talking about uh, uh, you know, in a minute uh, because the black hole is going to lose mass as a result of this particle creation effect. And it, the, its mass loss is given essentially by the Stefan Boltzmann law. And the smaller, the less mass of the black hole is, the more mass it radiates. So this is a runaway process and an isolated black hole should evaporate completely in a finite amount of time that finite amount of time is impossibly long for a solar mass black hole, even if it was completely isolated and wasn't absorbing the microwave background, which is at a much bigger temperature than the Hawking temperature. But if you had a primordial black hole of about 10 to the 15th grams produced in the early universe, it would be evaporating right now. But as a matter of principle, this is certainly extremely important and that modifies the space-time diagram of a black hole that I showed you before because now if we we're producing an isolated black hole well most of this diagram is the same as what I just showed you uh, a few minutes ago but in if you look at the dotted event horizon line, I mean, there is an enormous period of time where that is just going along uh, without much change, but in fact, it's slowly decreasing in size. And eventually, 10 to the 73 seconds later, if this is a solar mass black hole, it'll decrease down to Planck size, and it will have decreased down to Planck size, and presumably will evaporate completely and just leave empty space-time behind. So I'll return to that uh, in a in a minute. So we now see that uh, kappa over two pi is not just an analogous quantity to temperature. It is really the physical Hawking temperature of a black hole. Well, that leaves one other pair of analogous quantities, the entropy in thermodynamics and a quarter of the area. We've fixed the numerical constants now by the Hawking temperature calculation. So the one quarter is now fixed on the area when you compare the first law formulas. So what are area and entropy related? Well, there's very good indirect reason to think they are the same physical quantity. Now, to calculate the entropy of a black hole from first principles, we would need a quantum theory of gravity. Everything I've told you thus far has been derived from classical general relativity, and then with the Hawking effect, looking at quantum field theory in a given classical black hole background, where we're taking the back reaction into account 
with the black hole evaporation. But if we're going to count states or do something like that, we really need a quantum theory of gravity. So we don't have that at present, at least not to the extent that we could use it. Well, there are some string theory calculations. Let me not get into the details of that that are for special classes of black holes are counting states, not really of the black holes, but of flat space time configurations with the same charges and mass, mass and charges as the black holes that remarkably reproduce the formula with state counting for uh, the entropy, uh, re reproduce the area. Um, but we don't have a, a quantum gravity description of the black hole of the true black holes themselves, and these calculations are only for you know BPS as uh, uh, you know the technical characterization black holes. These were calculations of about twenty years ago by, by uh, Vafa and Strominger and others. Um, but there is some very some more circumstantial or indirect argument that I think convincingly shows that the area of a black hole must be its entropy. And that's because there are actually serious problems with both the ordinary second law and the classical black hole area theorem. So what are these problems? Well, if a what's the problem with the second law that's survived many centuries already rather unscathed. Well, the problem is if you have a black hole present, you can, well, it really makes sense only to consider matter outside black holes in your bookkeeping because you can't keep track of matter that's gone into black holes. Um, and the matter that goes into black holes falls into the singularity, so it's really gone. You can't catch up with it even if you go into the black hole. Um, but if you only count matter outside black holes, then it's very easy to decrease the entropy of black holes. Sorry, it's very easy to decrease the entropy of matter outside black holes by just dropping matter into a black hole. So that's kind of a problem for the second law, I mean, uh, as I've indicated. Um, uh, what's the problem with the area theorem? Well, the area theorem is a theorem, but a hypothesis of the theorem is that you have locally positive energy falling into the black hole. And in quantum field theory, it's easy to get states with locally negative, you know, for appropriate periods of time, locally negative energy densities in small enough regions. And in the particle creation process, in fact, you have a negative flux of energy into the black hole. So you can decrease the area. In fact, I already argued that black holes will evaporate. Their area will go to zero. You violate the uh, black hole second law. But there's an, uh, uh, well, I shouldn't say obvious. It wasn't that obvious when Bekenstein first proposed it. But if you take the area, uh, if you take the entropy of matter outside black holes and add it to the area, to one quarter the area of black holes, and I've put in the fundamental constants of nature that go into this, I've still set the Boltzmann constant to one, I guess, but uh, you know, this is kind of a nice formula that has constants from all areas of physics in it, uh, then you plausibly get something that never decreases. Because if you send in, throw in some matter with positive entropy into the, with entropy into the black hole, that will increase the area of the black hole. And when the black hole evaporates, it will spew out uh, uh, matter in a thermal distribution 
outside black holes, increasing the entropy of matter outside black holes. And if you look at this carefully, it, including clever Gedanken experiments designed to violate this, one finds that uh, at least in any calculations people have been able to do, this generalized second law has to hold. Well, the obvious interpretation of it is uh, of the generalized second law is that one quarter the area of a black hole is really the physical entropy of a black hole. And this generalized second law that I've written here is just the ordinary second law where you're adding the entropy of black holes to the entropy of ordinary matter outside black holes to get the total entropy, which never decreases, even though those two things can decrease individually. Okay, well, I'm running well behind uh, the pace I should be at, so I'm going to just say a few words about uh, the information issue uh, uh, very briefly, and that's based on the fact that, uh, well, that's based on entanglement and the fact that entanglement is ubiquitous in quantum field theory. So just very briefly, if you have two subsystems in quantum mechanics, their Hilbert space is, is described by the tensor product of the Hilbert spaces of the individual systems. That includes tensor product states simple product states, but it also includes linear combinations of them that can't be written as product states. And when you have states of that sort, the two systems are said to be entangled and you can't describe either system by just a pure state in either one of the Hilbert spaces. You have to describe it by a density matrix or a mixed state. And what I've written at the bottom of the slide is to indicate that you have entanglement ubiquitously in quantum field theory if you're looking at, if you take as your system two regions of space time uh, and the fields in those regions, they will always be entangled or they will certainly always be entangled if those regions are neighboring each other. Uh, so let me skip this slide and get to uh, the space-time diagram that illustrates the information loss issue. So I've drawn here this same diagram that I already went over with, with you on uh, the formation of a black hole and its eventual evaporation. And the only new thing I've drawn in to that diagram are these three roughly horizontal uh, blue lines. So those are representing some space-like hypersurface, so space at an instant of time. The bottom one at early times, the middle one uh, at time, a time during the evaporation and the final one at a time after the evaporation of the black hole. So we assume that in the, in the initial early time state at the bottom of this diagram, uh, we have a, a pure state. Now, because of this entanglement that I just described of quantum fields, we're gonna have entanglement or in particular one could also equally well say correlations in the state of the field inside and outside the black hole during evaporation. This is, you know, well, there are cor such correlations on either side of the horizon near the horizon, but the Hawking radiation uh, that goes out that would be registered partly on this uh, state will be similarly entangled with 
excitations of the field inside the black hole. And so if we look at this intermediate time on the at the state of the field inside the black hole, uh, sorry, if we look at the state of the field outside the black hole at this intermediate time, it will be in a mixed state because it will be entangled with what's inside the black hole. So this would not normally bother people and does not normally bother people. And the same thing would be true in flat space time. If you divided space into two halves, you'd have neither half would be in a pure state. But the new twist on this is that the black hole is predicted to evaporate completely. And that will leave you a mixed final state because what you have in this final state is still entangled with things that went into the black hole. Now, the things that went into the black hole, well, in this diagram, they will disappear into the singularity. Maybe you don't really have a singularity, uh, but, you know, that wouldn't help very much if you have some, you know, what people call baby universe inside. You still have a mixed state in what an observer would see. So if you're looking if you're looking for some scattering problem of ingoing state versus outgoing state, you have pure, a pure state evolving to a mixed state. Well, I'll just take a couple of minutes to, to talk about what, I mean, this is a startling prediction of the Hawking effect and its back reaction on black holes, and I think a very interesting prediction. And uh, if I was just going to give my own view, that was, this is where I would, uh, I could stop the talk here. I mean, I should stop, I will stop it within a few minutes anyway, because uh, I'm, I'm already running a little bit over. But uh, I would just say you have a really interesting phenomena that you have a pure state evolving to a mixed state. There's nothing wrong with this. The local, I mean, we're obtaining this result using ordinary quantum field theory and curved space time together with you know semi-classical back reaction of the black hole uh, there's no violation of any local law of physics whatsoever in this whole uh, process uh, and I don't see anything wrong with this or any problem with it um, I'm very much in the minority on this view. I, I, Bill Unruh shares, totally shares my view, but we are very much uh, in the minority. If you're gonna reject this view, then there has to be something wrong with the picture I was just showing you. And that might occur at early times, that might occur during the evaporation, that might occur in the final moments of evaporation, or that might occur in the singularity. The idea that you don't form a black hole seems to me to be really radical. Uh, and I have a lot of trouble, you know, uh, the fuzzball picture is the, the most prominent example of that. Let me not say more about that than I just don't see why classical general relativity should break down during a collapse. Another radical, in my view, proposal is that you have some major departure from quantum field theory and curves, classical general relativity and quantum field theory and curved space time during the evaporation. The firewall idea is that you make, in fact, a singular horizon and don't have the correlations between inside and outside the black hole is you know, the most prominent example of this. Again, I have a lot of trouble seeing why there should be any breakdown of known physics in this sort of rather mundane low curvature regime. Uh, it could be that maybe you really don't evaporate the black hole and you leave a remnant that's not a radical alternative because that doesn't require a breakdown of known physics in a known regime. 
It would just be you stop evaporating when you get near the Planck scale. But it isn't at all clear what good remnants would do. I mean, what's the difference between information is lost or information is not lost but is totally inaccessible? Uh, and if the remnants are able to exchange information or whatever, then you'd ex there would be thermodynamic arguments against them because you they'd be very thermodynamically favored as having extremely low ener energy but extremely high entropy. Uh, and then maybe you don't have the singularity. That's certainly not radical. And you know, I wouldn't want to take a position on whether you do have a singularity, but that somehow what comes out from the singularity goes back into our universe. This is a possibility I've looked at in some detail, but it suffers uh, there. And there are some ideas that, that I think were very much worth looking at in terms of ways of doing it. But the, the basic problem which exists in these ideas that I'm not going to attempt to describe that involve entanglement with the final vacuum state uh, all require a huge number of particles to be produced from a Planck-sized object uh, and you know, an arbitrarily large amount of energy and number of particles to be produced from a Planck-sized object. So I don't think that's viable. So I was would have, if there were more time, uh, maybe gone through some of the arguments that people have given against information loss. But instead of that, I will just conclude that uh, as I hope I've illustrated, uh, the study of black holes has really led to some quite remarkable and deep, clearly very deep connections relating gravitation, quantum theory, and thermodynamics. And it's clear we're not done yet. Uh, and it's certainly my hope and it's also my expectation that we have more to learn and hopefully we'll get some more fundamental insights uh, from this line of work. Okay, so that's, uh, that's it. Thank you and sorry for going a bit over time. Thank you very much, Professor Bob Wald. Uh, first of all, I'd like uh, to ask everybody to turn on their microphones and clap our hands as an acknowledgement. <laughs> Oh, uh, I know that you cannot see, uh, so I ask everybody to turn off their microphones again, so uh, you cannot see, but your audience has reached several times 200 participants, Professor, so it's a lot of people. I mean, it seems that you're talking to an empty room, but it's far, far, far from it. And, and uh, well, uh, let me just tell that people can leave their, their questions in the chat either by writing down their questions so that I can read it, either by writing, I have a question, and then I will pass uh, the, the word to the person to make the question. Uh, and while people write down their questions, uh, let me just give you an overview of the audience. So we had uh, participants of more than half of the Brazilian Federation units from all the five regions of Brazil, so extreme north, extreme south, southeast, northeast, central west, and southeast. So uh, apart from uh, uh, people from Brazil and people from our graduate program, obviously a lot of students of our graduate program, teachers and professors of our graduate program, postdocs, but also people from all the countries, like uh, I can mention Argent Argentina in South America, also Mexico, Italy in Europe, India in Asia, so from all around. I, I, I know it because I'm seeing other people from other countries, some of them very, very far away from Brazil. Uh, but, uh, and, and I must tell you also that there, uh, use, there is a huge representation of the Brazilian community on gravitation and cosmology, 
from different places all around. So uh, quite, quite a nice audience, nice Brazilian audience. So you uh, can rest assured that today you have gave a talk to Brazil <laughs> and also uh, uh, to other places. So let's move on to the, to the questions now. Uh, so the first question comes from uh, Mateus Pereira Lobo from the University Federal Federal University of Tocantins in the center of Brazil. So I don't know if Mateus uh, wants to make the question himself or he wants me to read it. Okay, so uh, I'll read it. Uh, so according to Hawking's book, uh, the large scale structure of space time. Topologically speaking, the singularity is the rupture of space-time. Isn't it natural to suppose that the tear in space-time increase in size, increase in size due to the accumulation of more and more matter, pushing by means of a topological force all the matter energy to the event horizon? This explains the firewall and also explains the entropy depending in its area. In summary, do you think that Planckian curvature tears space-time apart? And then he mentions uh, a, a paper that he has published together with collaboration collaborators recently. Yeah. Well. Okay. So, first of all, I mean, the firewall idea is occurring, you know, at the event horizon, or at least very near the event horizon, and has to occur. I mean, if we're talking about a macroscopic black hole, and let's say a solar mass black hole. You know, the firewall has to form uh, certainly before the, you know, roughly half the mass of the black hole has evaporated. So that's a very low curvature regime. And then that's not, that's not anywhere near the singularity. It's not anywhere near a singular regime and not anywhere near in time as far as Planck scales go to the singularity that's in the future. So that's what I have uh, difficulty, you know, believing about the, the firewall picture. Now, as far as the singularities themselves are concerned, that's a major open question in general relativity as to what generically the singularities look like. Uh, the strong cosmic censorship conjecture, uh, which is not, uh, what I mentioned cosmic censorship about singularities uh, contained within black holes. The strong cosmic censorship conjecture is really an independent conjecture. It's not stronger or weaker than the, the one I just, uh, than the black holes conjecture. But that effectively says that generically singularities have to be either space-like as I've drawn them or null. Um, but even, I mean, that's not known to be true. And furthermore, I mean, even if they were known to be space-like or null, what they really look like, whether the curvature has to blow up uh, on them or there is other singular behavior, uh, just isn't known. So there's not really very much one can say about singularities, but that shouldn't affect, you know, discussions of whether the firewall picture is viable or how that works, because that isn't anywhere close to the singularity, at least that you'd have in classical general relativity. Of course, they're postulating a new singularity, but then it has to be explained how that formed. Okay, so thank you, Matheus, for your question. Thank you, Professor Wald, for your answer. And uh, now let's move to the second question. Uh, it is from Satish Kumar VH. Uh, Satish, do you want to read your question? Do you want to make a question? Do you want me to read it? So I'll read it. Uh, do all freely falling and Asymptomatic observers agree with laws of black hole mechanics. And a second question, since you taught us that black hole entropy is a nether charge, uh, is an weather charge, is it an invariant quantity for all observers? Um, the 
Yeah, I mean, the, the laws of black hole mechanics, uh, in particular, let's look at the first law, you know, with the second equation on this slide. I mean, what that's really doing is relating quantities that are defined globally at infinity, in particular the mass, uh, and also the angular momentum and charge, although you, uh, well, yeah, the angular momentum and, and charge, although you could define those uh, at the horizon instead of at infinity and, you know, but anyway, this is a global law. And again, the area of the event horizon, you can't tell what the area of the event horizon is without looking at the whole event horizon. So there, a local observer falling into the black hole or whatever can't verify the first law of thermodynamics or whatever. You need, you know, the whole family of observers and these would really be observers at infinity and or possibly observers near the horizon to get the black hole area. Um, so the, these laws are not laws of local physics, nor are really the laws of ordinary thermodynamics local laws. They are laws that apply, you know, to, you know, the entire system and in many cases apply to the entire system when it's in thermal equilibrium. Okay. So uh, thank you, Satish, for your question. Thank you, Professor Wald, for your answer. Uh, the next question comes from Giorgio Torghieri. Uh, just uh, to register, I ask the people that is going to make the question themselves to start speaking, saying where they are speaking from. So Giorgio, we want to turn on your microphone and sure. make a question. Sure. Um, yeah, I am speaking from the University of Campinas, close to Sao Paulo. So my question is, a few years back, there were Frank Wilczek and collaborators had this very interesting re-derivation of the Hawking entropy formula using the WKB approximation, basically. First quantization, WKB, and the flux of particles came from the imaginary part. And in this derivation, this derivation parallels the Schwinger effect derivation. This was the other big use of the WKB approximation in field theory. And in the Schwinger effect, there is also a uh, loss of information. I mean, that's what people calculate. They isolate the imaginary part of the action and they interpret it as a number of particles. And no one says that this is a paradox because we all know it's an approximation. The approximation is that a classical field becomes quantum particles. It's semi-classical, and that doesn't respect unitarity. Um, why can't the black hole information paradox be exactly the same thing? The semi-classical approximations don't have to respect unitarity. This has been known within quantum field theory for a while. Yeah, well, I mean, the... In the other cases, you don't have another system that's sort of disappearing or whatever in this way. But uh, let me answer the question more, uh, you know, directly. So, uh, it, it, in the well, not answer the question more directly, but say the following thing that that's maybe even further, uh, you know, sharpening the, the difficulty. So. The thing is, the the, I mean, the Hawking, you know, one might argue that the Hawking effect, you know, is missing some key ingredient, sort of in Planck scale physics near the horizon. I mean, the, the Hawking particles do originate from sort of arbitrarily close to the horizon at very early times, and maybe we don't have the physics right there. So, you know, uh, so I. That statement is in, uh, you know, some agreement with what, with the point that you're, that you were making in your question. You know, so why should we trust that? But if I go to this picture, I mean, in my initial pure state, 
I could have arranged things so that I did a bunch of EPR experiments, uh, you know, decaying particles or whatever, and half of those particles I kept outside the black hole, and the other half I put into this collapsing body that goes into the black hole. So then, even if you don't count the Hawking, even if you don't worry about all the entanglement that the Hawking radiation has with inside the black hole, because that was some semi-classical approximation, and you know you didn't, you don't trust that, or it's not giving the right, you know, uh, answer for the, for the entanglement or whatever. Um, you still have all this entanglement that you created yourself between the collapsing matter and your laboratory outside the black hole. And in principle, you could make that arbitrarily correlated. So if the black hole is then going to evaporate, uh, as predicted by the Hawking effect, but maybe it does it in a way that the Hawking radiation ends up being purified, you've still got a major problem that can't be answered by, oh, this semi-classical approximation formalism just didn't capture that. I mean, you know, there's no question that if you create EPR pairs, you're going to have entanglement between outside the black hole and inside the black hole. And how are you going to end up, you know, your state in your laboratory is definitely going to be a mixed state during the collapse because of the entanglement with the collapsing matter. And how are you going to get that information out? I mean, that's, you know, I mean, the, the Hawking radiation is a much more entanglement and, you know, much more information loss than I could practically do with EPR pairs. But in principle, you still have the same problem. And I don't see what could be wrong with you know, any analysis that gives the entanglement of EPR pairs, unless quantum mechanics is completely wrong or whatever, but then, you know, that's going down quite a bit, you know, further down some other path. Okay, thank you, Georgia, for your question. Thank you, Professor Wald, for your answer. So next question uh, comes from Sidney Atsuka, Junior, Sydney. Sydney, do you want to turn on your microphone and ask your question? Yes, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. It was amazing. Uh, and I learned a lot of things about the black holes. So, uh, in the, the start of the presentation, you said that uh, a particle inside the black hole would not be in equilibrium, right? it would fall to the singularity. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, imagine if there is a, a kind of a, um, state equation, maybe an exotic state equation for the matter inside the black hole that would not generate a singularity. Uh, is that possible? Well, it's certainly possible that what I've drawn in here is the singularity, and it's probably better to look at this diagram, is really, you know, not a singularity, and there's something else that replaces that. It's just hard to see how that could affect any results about phenomena outside black holes, or for that matter, Hawking radiation, or whatever, which is all originating very far, you know, all has to do with the physics that's nowhere near that singularity. You know, the singularity is kind of later than anything else you're interested in, in, in a sense. Okay, so thank you, Sydney, for your question. Uh, thank you, Professor Bob Wald, for your answer. And then let's uh, move to the next question. It comes from Sérgio Joras from Rio de Janeiro. Sérgio, do you want me to to uh, read it for you? Or you already turned your microphone, so please go on. Yeah, I'm just getting ahead of you, Christina. Thank you, thank you, uh, Christina. Thank you, Professor Wald, for the talk. 
So I, I have a, perhaps a too naive question. If an observer throws a piece of information at a black hole, from his or her point of view, this, this piece of information will never cross the horizon because of time dilation. So can this observer say that this piece of information is really lost? And what happens to that piece of information from the point of view of this observer when the black hole loses its mass? So can you say, can you recover this, this piece of information or, or not? Classically, I mean. Well, so it's true that if you're, you know, if you're, if you're a distant observer, you know, so you're some time-like world line far to the right in this diagram or or you're some observer at you know like one that's passing through the event on the left light cone that i drew in, in this diagram um you don't see any of the matter once it's crossed the horizon and indeed you know the light reaching you you know from the matter just before it crosses the horizon takes arbitrarily long to uh, reach you. I mean, now in practice, you just won't see anything very quickly because there's such a big redshift and there's such a big, uh, you know, time dilation, one could say, uh, you know, that you're not going to get any more photons uh, or not at not any photons at any frequencies that you your eyes would be sensitive to or whatever um but that doesn't mean that the star doesn't collapse to this singularity well i don't know whether it collapses to the singularity but the the star doesn't notice anything it will just go into into a black hole i mean it it you know it it will just keep collapsing well beyond the horizon that locally the observer falling in with the star wouldn't notice anything uh, special happen when when he or she is crossing is crossing the horizon. I mean, it's a little bit like if I if I were able in flat space time to uniformly accelerate forever, then there would be a lot of light that you might be emitting that will never reach me. I mean, I'll get exactly the same kind of time dilation redshift effect, you know, that you might attribute to my acceleration. But anyway, uh, if I'm out there accelerating, I just don't, I see you slow down and never get past a certain point. Of course, I stop seeing photons from you, you know, fairly quickly. But uh, in any case, so I mean, you know, should I say you never ate your lunch if this happens to, you know, be happening just as you're starting lunch uh, and you're beyond my horizon when you've eaten lunch? Uh, um, no, you still ate lunch. I mean, so it, it, it you know, yeah, I, I think the, the, you know the the slowing down and you don't cross the horizon is i mean that's true that because you're it's forming a black hole i don't see what happens after you've crossed the horizon and what happened just before you cross the horizon gets stretched out in principle to a large amount of time but that doesn't stop the fact that all the matter goes into the black hole and that doesn't really change anything on the story of what happens when a black hole evaporates and it doesn't change the information loss issue. Okay, so thank you, Sandra, for your question. Thank you, Professor Bobo, for your answer. Next question comes from uh, Leonardo Pipolo de Gioia. Leonardo, do you want to make the question yourself or do you want me to read it? I can ask it. Okay, go ahead. Uh, basically, first, thanks, Prof. Professor Robert Walt, for the talk. It was great. Uh, I would like to know how you view the implications of that infrared triangle that Andy Strominger has been talking about, connecting asymptotic symmetries 
saw theorems on memory effects upon black hole physics? Um, so I've actually, in the last few years, worked quite a bit on memory effect, and there's a lot of interesting stuff regarding memory effect, you know, asymptotic symmetries and infrared divergences and so on. I don't see any connection with black holes or black hole information loss. I mean, one recent paper that I wrote with uh, Adele Rahman, who was an, actually an undergraduate at Chicago and is now a graduate student at Stanford, uh, looked at how one might define a notion of memory for black hole horizons. And there are some interesting analogs one can, or analogies one can make between black hole horizons and null infinity, where the memory effect is normally defined. But, uh, but the key results that relate, uh, you know, memory to symmetries and, uh, well, charges and fluxes, uh, uh, and so on don't seem to carry over. So the the relevant answer to your question, I think, is that I don't see any relation between the the you know ideas on memory, of which I think there are a number of interesting ideas. And I and as I say, I've been working on that myself for independent reasons. But I don't see any connection between that. Uh, and the black hole entropy or information loss issue. I mean, the Hawking Perry Strominger paper, you know, made strong suggestions in that regard and, and certainly generated a lot of interest, but uh, I personally don't see anything, you know, there that, you know, would that I can see as plausibly leading to some new idea, you know, that would give a different answer to the black hole information issue and, and or might give more in, insight into black hole entropy. Okay, so thank you, Leonardo, for your question. Professor Bobo for your answer. Next question comes from Natalia Molle. Natalia, do you want to make the question yourself? Yes, uh, thank you, Luis. Uh, thank you, Walt, for your seminar. Um, I would like to know if this information loss of a black hole is more fundamental than uh, information loss due to the coherence of a quantum system, um, uh, the interaction of this quantum system with an environment, if this black hole is more fundamental. Yeah, so it's different, uh, and I think, and I think one could probably say more fundamental in that it's exactly the same as the interaction of the system with the environment if you could then make the environment disappear. So if somehow the environment was no longer there in the universe after you were done letting your system interact with the environment, then it would be exactly the same. Okay, uh, so um, you consider that um, maybe in the information laws in the decoherence of the environment, it would still be there, but we cannot access. Yeah, right. I mean, it's more, it's a practical matter rather than something fundamental. I mean, so, uh, yeah, I mean, you, a good thing to think about would be you know, if you had a lump of coal that, you know, was heated up and emitting thermal radiation, that would be a lot kind of like a black hole, but then you let it radiate and cool down to absolute zero, you know, well, okay, this, maybe this is, this may not be the right analogy for the particular question you asked me, but the kind of thing people, think about or talk about with regard to black holes is, you know, initially there would be a lot of entanglement between the radiation and the state of the coal, but eventually the, you know, the information would come out because, you know, 
if an, if an atom emitted a photon early, that would be correlated with whether it emits an atom late in such a way that the final state of the photons would end up being pure. But the black hole is not like that because you don't, you know, the emission is not coming from the black hole itself, it's coming from outside the black hole. So I think I went off a little bit on a tangent thinking of something else. What I said initially, I think, was much more directly addressing your question, which is the entanglement is the same, but the, uh, you know, the fact that your system ends up in a mixed state is more a practical matter of you not being able to measure the environment to see that the whole system is in a pure state. Whereas in the black hole case, there isn't any environment left and your system is really in a mixed state and it's not just okay. the inability for you to tell it. But I, I don't find it any more alarming that you end up in a mixed state in the black hole case than I would find it alarming that your system ended up in a mixed state when after it interacted with the environment. And um, but in this case of the radiation that comes from outside the um, black hole, could it be some kind of um, entanglement and uh, swap that um, it happens some particles that never interacted, but they interacted with previously with particles that were entangled, and without being never entangled, they are uh, never interacted, they are entangled because of this previous interaction. Could happen something with these quasi particles in the outside of the horizon? And yeah. then it, uh, I mean, the thing is it's not, there's no obvious or natural way to define, or there are several or more than one way or whatever to define a notion of particles near the horizon. Okay. And, and notion of a particle that a stationary observer would define is very different from the notion of a particle that a freely falling observer would naturally define. Okay. And indeed, exactly trying to understand better this notion of particles and so on that led UNRU to discover the UNRU effect by thereby finding that an accelerating observer in flat space time would have a very different notion of particles than a freely than an inertial observer okay thank you a lot okay thank you natalia thank you professor bob Wald, for your answer so just uh, uh, we still have one more question but before that let me tell you that we still have more than 100 people in the audience although we are more than one hour and a half of your presentation but before that, just to register, I'd like to read the name of the Brazilian Federation units that were present in your talk. So it's Pará, Amapá, Tocantins, Maranhão, Ceará, Rio Grande do Norte, Pernambuco, Paraíba, Goiás, Distrito Federal, Rio de Janeiro, Espírito Santo, Minas Gerais, São Paulo e Rio Grande do Sul. So, as I said, more than half of all the Brazilian Federation units. So, uh, thank you very much once again. There are many compliments in the chat. So it's good to read because people that were not mentioned start to write. So one more state, Santa Catarina. So the last question in the chat comes from Isabelle Costa. Isabelle, do you want to make the question yourself or do you want me to read it? Okay, I'll read it then. Uh, since the theme of black hole radiation deals with a lot of topics in physics, like thermodynamics, general relativity and quantum mechanics, do you expect that the problem of quantum gravitation will pop out of a further investigation on this topic? Uh, I'm not so optimistic that it will just pop out, but what this really does is give, you know, I mean, one of the troubles with quantum gravity is that you know, once one has a theory, a fully developed theory where you can calculate whatever you want uh, of quantum gravity, uh, it's pretty unlikely that there'll be some laboratory experiment that can verify it or not. But 
this is kind of a, you know, a second best thing to laboratory experiments. I mean, a, a, a major target for any quantum theory of gravity is that it ought to explain black hole entropy. It ought to, you know, explain in a more fundamental way the quantum behavior of black holes. And, uh, you know, if it uh, resolves the information issue by saying that you get a pure state, then it should be explaining how it is that you really end up with a pure state, even, you know, despite the semi-classical analysis giving you very much a mixed state. So this is really, you know, I, I don't think that pondering these results are is going to inspire someone to think up uh, a, a, a new quantum theory of gravity, but I do think that when one comes up with a new theory of gravity, this is really, this is extremely valuable because it provides something to test it against. Okay, so thank you, Isabella. Isabelle for the question. Thank you, Professor Wald, for your answer. So somebody wrote down, uh, so there are many compliments in the chat. Thank you for your very nice talk, etc. And uh, well, I mean, uh, and there's one question that has been written. I mean, uh, one thing that we miss after these webinars is people such of somebody like you that has very, I mean, important, uh, written very important textbooks that has helped, as I said in the beginning, uh, for to educate uh, many people in the area is that you won't have those people coming to you in the end of the talk with your book asking for an autograph and something like that, right? But uh, Alvaro Luiz Dominguez Guimarães, I'll kind of rephrase his question saying, do you have any uh, intention to write another book or even another edition of your very nice books that you uh, have already written? Um, so I don't... I until it becomes, you know, absolutely necessary, I do not plan to write another edition of the general relativity book. I mean, I think the the amount of effort it would take to kind of up there there are a few parts, of course, particularly cosmology that I really like to update, but the amount of work that it would require to update everything else to the present day, you know, so that people who've written papers since 1984 are not angry with me for not citing them uh, and so on. Uh, you know, I, I think I'd rather keep the book as a snapshot of what we knew in 1983, 84, uh, and people hopefully can forgive me if it's not up to date on observational cosmology. I mean, it, remarkably, I, the timing was good enough that, you know, inflation and so on uh, were already on the table when I wrote the book. So at least I can make some allusion to that and string theory even and uh, so on. I mean, I only make allusions to that. But uh, in terms of other books, I have actually just written a, you know, what, well, a graduate level textbook on electromagnetism. I mean, mainly because I've taught that the last few years and I was just completely fed up with the existing textbooks in terms of just the whole approach to electromagnetism and, you know, treating point charges as fundamental and point charges produce or charges produce electric fields and Coulomb's law as kind of a fundamental beginning of electromagnetism, I think is, a, is actually a very bad starting point or whatever. Uh, so uh, thanks largely to the pandemic, uh, I finished the book, uh, you know, about a month ago. Uh, so that probably should be out in about a year. Uh, but that's not a general relativity book, but it is a, a, a an electromagnetism book written from the point of view of a general relativist. 
to like the initial value formulation of Maxwell's equations. I mean, all the standard topics are in there, but initial value formulation of Maxwell's equations is covered and things like that. So that, okay. gave, that gave me the opportunity to plug my book, I guess. So thank you. Uh, but it won't be out for another, you know, full year probably. Okay, so thank you, Alvaro, for your question. Thank you, Professor Wald, for your answer and for your wonderful talk. And before we finish, I would like to ask everybody to turn on their microphones again for a final clap of our hands in acknowledgement to this very good.